I'm delighted to be part of this celebration too. Very grateful to be invited. And I'm even grateful that the subject is not the death of the book. I've been invited to so many conferences on the death of the book, I'm beginning to suspect it's alive. Uh, it reminds me, this death of the book business, of my one of my favorite graffiti in the men's room of Princeton University Library, which says, God is dead, signed Nietzsche. You, you've run across it, yes. And then someone else writes underneath, Nietzsche is dead, signed God. <laughs> Um, the, the death of the book really is exaggerated. More titles are produced each year than in the preceding year worldwide, with the exception of last year, which was a di disaster for everyone. Uh, the graph goes up and up and up and up, and it's nearly one million new titles in print. The old-fashioned printed codex is doing very well, thank you. Um, but it means that we suffer from information overload. Everyone in this room does, I'm sure, but it's not new. Uh, Anne Blair from the Harvard History Department is just about to publish a wonderful book about information overload as a historical phenomenon that goes at least back to the 16th century. So we have a tendency to exaggerate the otherness of our present environment. If we want to get some sense of what the future will be like, it seems to me we should look into the past. I'm an historian, that's what I do for a living anyhow. And so I would like to suggest one good book in which to see the future, published in 1771. It's called The Year 2440 by Louis Sébastien Mercier. It is the first utopian novel set in the future. So he said it 700 years after he was born. He wakes up 700 years later. It's a kind of Rip Van Winkle tale. He walks around Paris and it's, it's a magnificent city that is free of all the abuses of the old regime of uh, 18th century France. At a climactic moment, he goes into the library and he's expecting to see an enormous, vast place, much bigger than the old Bibliothèque du Roi, which was already too big, full of information overload. But instead, he finds one small room with four tiny cabinets in it. And he asks the librarian, this is your library? What happened to all these books that must have accumulated over the last 700 years? The librarian says, we burned them. And then he gives a list, you know, 500 million novels and uh, 300,000 travel books and so on and so on. And Mercier says, but how, how could you burn them? Well, they were full of falsehood. We reduced them down to their essence, a few basic principles and moral truths. This was done by a committee of virtuous scholars, and that's all we need. Now, Mercier was a great pioneer of the Enlightenment. He didn't believe in book burning. But I think what he's expressing is our feeling of information overload and the need for guidance to find relative or relevant information in it. Um, so you could say he's actually describing what some people think is the future of libraries, just one room with a bunch of computers in it attached to databases that you can download as you desire. Uh, now, there's nothing futuristic about this at all because it already exists. It even has a name. The name is Google Book Search. And all of you use it, I think, practically every day. What is the effect of exposure to this vast world of digitized information? Well, I think we're having difficulty taking it in. But that kind of difficulty also can be understood if you look to the past. I would like to quote a letter written within 20 years of the invention or reinvention of movable type by Gutenberg. It's written by a man called Francesco Guarnerio in 1471, um, by, sorry, by Nicholas Perotti writing to Guernerio, and it goes as follows. I'll quote it. I won't go over my five minutes, I promise, Harry, but flag me if I'm abusing your patience. 
But imagine, it, it, I think it's a fascinating letter, and you'll see why. Quote, my dear Francesco, I have lately kept praising the age in which we live because of the great, indeed divine gift of the new kind of writing which was recently brought to us from Germany. In fact, I saw a single man printing in a single month as much as could be written by hand by several persons in a year. It was for this reason that I was led to hope that within a short time we should have such a quantity of books that there wouldn't be a single work which could not be procured because of lack of means or scarcity. Yet, so far so good, I'm, I'm with you, uh, David, uh, you're thinking Google book search. Oh, false and all too human thoughts. I see that things turned out quite differently from what I had hoped, because now that anyone is free to print whatever they wish, they often disregard that which is best and instead write merely for the sake of entertainment, which would best be forgotten or better still be erased from all the books. And even when they write something worthwhile, they twist it and corrupt it to the point where it would be much better to do without such books rather than have uh, having a thousand copies spreading falsehoods over the whole world, end quote. Well, um, he sounds like many of the critics of Google book search, uh, myself included. And I don't want to pile on the criticism. As you all know, there are, as far as I know, any bibliographers working for Google, but maybe I'm, am I wrong about that? Yeah. Okay. Well, we can search it in Google and find out. Uh, but, you know, Google just takes whatever comes off the shelf at Michigan, and so they have the wrong editions, and they're missing volumes, and you see hands over the page, and you're told that the error rate is only 0 0.5, but for a 300-page book, that's a page or two, not good enough. Um, they categorize things according to very arbitrary categories so that leaves of grass comes up under gardening uh, <laughs> and, and so on and so on. But I don't think this is fair criticism really because the great thing about Google is they say, okay, we made a mistake, we'll work on it and make it better. So I'm not saying that Google book search is a disaster on the, uh, just the contrary. What really worries me about it is it's so good. It's so good that it shouldn't be in the hands of a corporate monopoly because monopolies tend to charge monopoly prices. There's no price control. Google does no evil now, but it might tomorrow. Or even if uh, people like Craig are no longer there, the people who buy out Google, which is only 11 years old, uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, might just want to maximize profits. And so I don't think this fabulous database should be in the hands of a corporate monopoly, I think it should be harnessed for the public good. Well, I was going to say a few bit, bits more about how this exposure to the digital world word has changed the experience of reading, because that's what the letter about the reaction to the printed book is saying. It, of course, is changing the reactions to reading in all kinds of ways, and I think that's Sherry Turkle's subject, so I'll leave it to her. But I think when we say there are digital natives who are reading books that are born digital, we think we're explaining something, but we're not. The technology will continue to change, and the relation between the reader and the text will vary. So there, we're going through a period of tremendous confusion, like that of these Italians after they saw the first printed books, and we haven't got it solved. So we're facing really a new world in which we need guidance. And I believe that a lot of the guidance is going to come not from search mechanisms, although they are terrific, but from human beings we call teachers. So when you come right back to it, it's teachers and books that really count. The printed book as well as the electronic book. Uh, I'm all for digital futures, but I think whatever we do, we must hold on to these two implements because they will make all the difference in the attempt to navigate this very confusing world.